Thank you. Oh, thank you, folks. This is where I say thank you for coming to my poetry reading. <laughs> Luckier than that. Um, how are we doing tonight? Good. Well, welcome back for the second in our new monthly series at Meet Krieger, talking about just whatever kind of comes to mind with Moore Smith. January was uh, creation night, and December we're going to get to Ragnarok. So between creation and Ragnarok, we're going to focus on a couple different gods and stories. And uh, this is Odin night. So, I mean, every night is over the night, I guess, but <laughs> part of why we decided to set these up on Wednesdays was not only to give you something to do on Wednesdays, but as a little tribute to the God of Wisdom, after all. Um, there was a quotation from Hogemal, the words of Odin, that uh, has been floating through my mind a little bit lately, that's kind of a underappreciated one, I think, or under cited one, and I'll start you off with that. Let me point out for those of you who are familiar with modern Icelandic pronunciation, but I don't use modern Icelandic pronunciation when reading Old Norse, but reconstructed medieval pronunciation. Then I began to be fruitful. I became wise. I grew and I thrived. And then there's a really kind of interesting grammatical thing that's going on in the next half here. A word from me, from a word, sought a word, would be the most literal translation here. I translated it a little bit more fluidly in the text. One word chased another word flowing from my mouth. And then a work from me, from a work, sought a work. Again, I translate it a little bit more fluidly as one deed chased another deed flowing from my hands. So it put me in mind of a state that I think creative people get into sometimes of a sort of ecstatic uh, creative zone, right? Work followed work, word followed word. You know, at my best, sometimes in writing or working, I find myself in that kind of position where it's just like, oh, okay, just one comes after another, but most of the time it's not like that. <laughs> and Odin is a god of a sort of ecstatic disposition like this, right? He's, his very name implies his connection to a state of a kind of ecstasy. The root word in his name is Odin, which is an adjective that um, I think can be best translated by the English word mad. And it has the exact same ambiguity, double or, or, or double meaning anyway, of the English word mad, both crazy and angry. And there's also a noun, urdi, the state of like a frenzy or, uh, uh, or, or ecstasy, I think is a fair, a fair way of putting it. And you know, people maybe look at the way that his character is portrayed in mass media and don't necessarily see this sort of ecstatic side of him, this weirdly mad side of him. But it's all over his appearances in the Eddas and in the Sagas. Right? He's a very weirdly uh, ambiguous character. Right? I mean, I, I remember when I was teaching these classes at UCLA or Berkeley or Colorado that the two characters that I saw people mix up the most often in narratives, right, it's, say the wrong person is doing something, were Odin and Loki. Right? Both are really kind of weirdly ambiguous, often at the threshold of different identities, often at the threshold of good and evil. And, you know, I just think how poorly served uh, that really ambiguous character is by something like your, you know, Shakespearean king that Anthony Hopkins kind of makes him out to be in the Marvel movies. It's not Anthony Hopkins' fault. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's there for a paycheck. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it is, it is a, kind of a poor representation of the actual character. 
And I think the best way that that can be illustrated by contrast with the Marvel movies is I remember when my brother tied me to a chair, a uh, rather uncomfortable one, probably like the ones the folks in the middle are, are, are seated on here. I, I, oh, I should, the, the much less comfortable than the wonderful accommodations that we <laughs> But I just mean, you know, like a, it, 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 I'm actually I'm pretty sure it didn't have a bottom. Uh, these chairs at least at the bottom. Um, and he clipped my eyelids open and he made me watch the original Thor movie. Now we at least had the riff tracks going at the same time, so I got to enjoy the, uh, that much of it. But I remember there's this scene where Odin gets really mad at Thor, and he says, you brought war to a peaceful realm, and he banishes him from, from all of Skyrim. And I just thought, God, this is the exact opposite of the real Odin and the Odin and the Sagas, because the real Odin would say, you brought war to a peaceful realm. <laughs> <laughs> right on. That's awesome. Thank you. More men involved. So, who is Odin and what's his main motivation? Well, he's the first individual, if you read the creation story in Snorri, He's the first individual after his dad, who's very, very vaguely described, Bor or Bor, who's described as one of the Asir, and it's the, the gods. And it's a little bit unclear why exactly all of a sudden, you know, everybody, all the sentient beings so far have been Jotnar, they've been Thursar, they've been uh, these beings that are described as you know the, the enemies of the gods. Well, Odin is descended from people who are all Jotnar or Thursar. Why all of a sudden they're being designated as Asir is a little bit unclear. But Odin just immediately turns around and kills his grandfather. Grandfather or great grandfather. I think he's his grandfather on one side, his great grandfather on the other side. Um, because he's the son of Thor, who's the son of Buri, who's the guy who's licked out of the ice by the cow. And then his mom, Bestla, is either the daughter of one of Ymir's sweat kids or one of his leg kids, I think it's <laughs> But at any rate, he, he and his brothers, Vili and Vey, kill Ymir, the original living being, and they make the earth out of him. Right? So the very first thing that he does upon coming onto the scene is kill someone for very unclear purposes. Except that maybe he thought, well, we need an earth. This guy's big. <laughs> These are the raw materials that we have at hand. Um, and he spends most of the rest of the mythic timeline killing one way or another, right? It's very, very seldom that Odin disapproves of a death. And I think that one of the really remarkable things about the death of Baldur, his most beloved son, is that it's a death that he doesn't want to happen, right? It's a death that he tries to prevent. Um, otherwise, the main death that he tries to prevent is his own. Right? He knows that Fenrir, the great wolf, uh, will kill him at Ragnarok, and so he has it chained up uh, forever. Uh, this is a story I'll probably get to you on whatever Loki night winds up being. But he is mostly going around and trying to get people killed. Right, And some of the most interesting stories in this connection are from sources that are less well known, I think, to people who are interested in the study of uh, the Norse myths. If you read the Eddas, Portica and the prose of, you're not going to find the story of Harold Wartooth, uh, legendary king of Denmark. You've got to love their names. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, you, you just had a son. Congratulations, by the way. Um, not named Wartooth, as I recall. We, we lack this advanced naming technology. But Harold Wartooth is the king of the Danes who Odin abundantly approves of the style of, according to Saxo Grammaticus, a uh, very underread source of Norse myth, right? Saxo Grammaticus is roughly a contemporary of Snorri Sturluson, who writes the Prozetta in Iceland. Saxo Grammaticus is a Dane who writes a very long, very wordy <laughs> series of books called Gesta Danorum, Deeds of the Danes, or usually translated in English as the History of the Danes. And um, in it, he tells of, uh, how Odin approved, or of course he's using this Latinized form of his name, Odinus. How Odin approved Harold Wartooth, this great war king, 
and uh, comes and tells him, well, I'm going to make you impervious to weapons of steel. Which sounds pretty great if you're a Norse sport king, right? Don't have to worry about swords, spears, arrows. I'm good. So Harold Wartooth lives a long, vibrant life of killing and conquering and adding to Odin's collection of dead men in the ball hole. But eventually, like all of Odin's favorites, he is going to enter his declining years. Right? We can't all be Tom Brady. And he finds himself on his chariot and uh, he's riding out to battle one day and he notices that his charioteer is a man that he's never seen before. And I love this about Odin because, of course, how is he described? He's, he's, he's Gandalf with one eye, right? J.R.R. Tolkien based actually the description of Gandalf on Odin, minus the one eye of So Odin is this guy who generally appears as an old man with a long gray beard, wearing a wide brimmed hat, we have to presume it's gray. Um, he's carrying a spear, typically, or a staff, and he often walks among human beings in disguise, and in his disguise, he's an old man, <laughs> hungry beard, usually a white hat, usually with a spear, or staff, uh, and somehow people never recognize him. Right? It's this, this minor super ability of being somehow forgettable. But uh, Harold Wartooth notices that his charioteer is an old man, one eye, etc., uh, someone he's never seen before, and as they're about to ride out to battle, the old man turns around and beats him to death with his wooden stick. <laughs> <laughs> so he died in battle. It counts. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is what Odin does, right? He's he's this like by our standards, very unpredictable jerk. <laughs> um, you don't want to accept things from him because he is going to take them back. Right, I mean, and my favorite example of this, we're going to have uh, one or two Volsungs tonight. We're going to look at the, the myths of the Volsung heroes, which I think are really underappreciated too. But of course, there's the hero Sigmundur. Uh, Odin appears to him very early in his life at the wedding of his sister. Uh, it's held in the hall of their father. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember all the generations of the Volsungs. Their dad is Sig. No. <laughs> Sigmunder's dad is, oh my god, the Sig this and Sig that. Um, was it not just Sigmund? I don't know, Sigmund, because I'm talking about Sigmunder. Oh, yeah. Sigmunder's dad. Sigma. Is it? Okay, Sig something, look. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it may actually be Siggy. <laughs> All right, anyway, his dad's hall has a big tree in the middle of it, which, by the way, if you read the saga of Volsungs, You'll notice that in the same paragraph, this tree is called both an oak tree and an apple tree. There's things they care about and things they don't care about. But it has this big tree in the middle of the hall that's called Barnstalker. And if you're familiar with Scandinavian languages, you might recognize the word barn, child. Barnstalker is effectively family tree. So in the middle of this wedding, an old man comes to the hall that nobody recognizes. It's a long beard and, you know, a weapon hat and a spear, et cetera, et cetera. One eye, naturally. He comes into the hall and he sticks a sword into this tree, right? And I think there's a pretty obvious symbolism in him sticking the sword into the quote-unquote family tree. And he says, whoever can take this sword from the tree will receive it as a gift from me. Which is, you know, I guess you might be pretty dangerous. Anyway, the long and short of it, Sigmunder takes it out. And of course, this will become his signature weapon for the next many years of his life. Until, on the edge of his uh, Tom Brady 40s, uh, he is riding out into battle, and who should he see coming against him in the front lines of the opposing army? But an old man he's never seen before. One eye, etc., etc. The old man has a spear that he starts to thrust at Sigmunder with, Sigmunder swings the sword given to him by Odin at the spear, and the sword shatters. And so he is slain in this battle, or he's at least mortally wounded in this battle, because his wife comes to him after the battle, and because he's a protagonist, he gets last words. Um, right, you know, if 
you're uh, <laughs> if you're one of the characters whose actor is in the opening credits of the movie, you can be assured that you're going to get last words. Guys like me don't get last words. <laughs> but guys like some of do. And he says, well, I have fought wars while it was Odin's pleasure. I think, yeah, that's, that's the right stoic attitude for one of Odin's favorites. He knows what's happened. He knows the score. He's been harvested, right? Before he got too old or too decrepit, he's harvested at the height of his powers to go up to Valhalla with Odin. And it's amazing how physical the descriptions of the afterlife are in Norse myth, right? They don't talk about the souls. They never talk about, like, his soul is in hell. His soul is in Valhalla. It's, he is in hell. He is in Valhalla. So Sigmundur is one of the most prominent dead man who was canonically in Valhalla with Odin. In fact, there are two poems that survived from the 900s from Norway about the deaths of Norwegian kings. There's uh, Eric's Mold, uh, about the dead king, Eric of Blodos, Blood Axe, again, fantastic names. Um, and then there's also uh, Hokan Mold, about uh, the death of Hokan the Good. And in both of them, when the dead king shows up in Valhalla, Sigmundur is there, and he's kind of the straight man to Odin. And uh, I believe it's in Hawkarnal where Sigmundur straight up asks Odin, well, if you liked Hawkarn so much, why did you kill him? And Odin says, because no one knows when the wolf will finally break out of its bonds. So he, he wants to make sure that all of the best warriors, they have their time on Earth, they get the guys killed that he wants killed, because he wants to harvest them too, you know, he doesn't care if they hate each other in life. But he wants to make sure that he's got them on his on his side when that final day comes. Odin is just haunted by this knowledge, the certain knowledge that Fenrir is going to come and kill him, and that Loki and the rest of his friends and relatives <laughs> will uh, kill the rest of the gods. And so he's just constantly going around trying to harvest men in this in this exact fashion. Another story, I think I might have mentioned this last time, but it's, it, it, it's worth revisiting here. It's told by Snorri in the Prosa, as part of the, uh, the mead, of, the, the myth of uh, Odin treating the mead, Othorir. As Odin is walking in disguise, you know, this old man with black brick hat and one eye, etc., through a field where nine, it's always nine, uh, nine slaves are working, and um, he says, uh, hey, it looks like your sides, right, they're mowing the sides, are getting dull. Let me sharpen this up for you. I've got a whetstone. It's, you know, get them nice and sharp like you've never seen. So he sharpens up their sides and says, oh, wow, you know, these have never been sharper. Can we buy the whetstone off of you? He says, sure, whoever's still alive when it comes to the ground can have it. Tosses it into the air. They kill each other with their newly sharpened sides. He catches his whetstone, and he's got nine more men involved. <laughs> so, you know, no one ever talks about loving Odin, even if they're one of his favorites, right? And Odin himself admits that he really shouldn't be trusted by human beings, or really kind of by anybody. I mean, Hallmall itself, a poem narrated by Odin, has a line, I believe Odin swore an oath to them, but who can trust Odin? <laughs> right. Oh, it says things, right? Um, and I just think that there's something really, really, really fascinating about this fantastically anxious figure being the head of the gods, at least from the conception of the poets, right? And this is something that we have to remember, too, is that our sources for these stories come from poetry, or they come from someone, in the case of Snorri or in the case of Saxo, who is reworking old poems. And Odin is a god favored by poets, but he probably wasn't favored by your sort of average, everyday Norseman. We have a lot more evidence, and in fact, fantastically more evidence for the worship of Thor, and even some pretty B-list gods, if you will, um, that don't come up in many of our stories. Prior, for example, even Heimdall or Tyr, these guys appear in very few stories, uh, looked like they were much more popular 
among just sort of everyday people. You see a lot more people named after them. You see a lot more places named after them, right? Thor's Grove, Thor's Sacred Place, Thor's Spade. Um, there's a factor of like 201 uh, versus like Odin's Grove, Odin's Sacred Place. There's just not as much of a public for someone who is potentially you know, gonna give you a cool sword, but he's gonna make sure that you can kill by somebody else's sword. Or, or maybe by your sword, that happens. Um, and, you know, you see these, uh, I think there's 800 or so of these little amulets of, uh, of Mjolnir uh, that are found in graves, they're found in marketplaces, people obviously bought and sold them in fair frequency as they do at today's metal shows. Um, but what's the equivalent for Odin? There's one interesting little spear amulet found at one side in Sweden that might perhaps be a parallel amulet worn by someone who's an Odin man as opposed to a Thor man. But I think that that 800 to one ratio looks about right. right? Thor is a everything, right? What do we see him doing in his stories, right? He's having a good time. He's always drinking, he's always eating. Everybody likes him, right? No one ever says, gosh, I hate you anymore, right? <laughs> Even when he goes to Jotunheimer, he's a pretty good guest. I mean, if you read Hemiskvita, one of the weirdest, hardest to read poems in the original language in the Poetic Edda, where Thor and Tyr, and it probably wasn't originally Tyr, because it's such a weird, I think it's a digression, but it doesn't seem like Tyr. But Thor and someone else go to Jotunheimer uh, and uh, stay with the guilt and Thor eats all the guy's food and then he goes out with him on a fishing trip to get him more, more food. So, oh man, you know, I'm sorry I ate everything in your pantry, but I'll, I'll help you refill it. And Thor's just, he's, he's a nice guy. And we see this contrast so vividly in multiple different stories. So for example, there's another poem in the poetic in a Horvar spiel. And it's a yo song. Hor is like hori gray here, right, same roots in English, and bottom beard, it's a gray beard song. So Thor has been traveling and he comes to the fjord, and there's a ferryman at the fjord, Odin appears more than once as a ferryman, um, and of course the ferryman is someone Thor has never seen before. <laughs> it's his dad. <laughs> How does he not marry? <laughs> but um, Thor says, you know, I'd like passage across the, the, the fjord, but Odin, gray beard, starts insulting you, right? Your clothes suck, right? You know, your clothes are all tattered. Uh, you don't look like you own farms. You don't look like you own horses. You don't look like you own ravens, right? The Norse are very class, very, very class sensitive. So putting him down is just sort of average, you know, lower middle class dude. And Thor gets all puffed up and upset. What are you talking about, Thor? Like, who are you? He's like, ah, never mind, man. Uh, and he says, you know, what, what have you been up to? Of course, well, I've been fighting the Jotunheimer, right? The enemies of the gods, the enemies of human beings, the enemies of, of, of order, right? I've been crushing them with my hammer. What have you been doing? He's like, <laughs> great, it's a seducing women. <laughs> they just go back and forth like this. Um, and toward the end, uh, Odin even admits that he has led an army, we don't know what the specific story uh, behind this is, but he even admits to leading an army against the gods at some point, which is like, well, we don't have the specific story anywhere, but I kind of believe it. Uh, <laughs> and Thor gets pretty upset about all of this and uh, threatens to crush Greybeard with his hammer. And Greybeard says, well, you know, it's a better target for your hammer, buddy. It's like, well, who's that? It's the guy who's sleeping with your wife. <laughs> I mean, it's just very, it's, it's very needle. Um, there's a similar, and, and he, at the end, by the way, he does not take him across the fjord. He says, well, you don't get to ride with me. <laughs> Thor says, well, you know, at least give me directions around the fjord, and that's how it ends, with him giving him these really vague directions. Um, it's a weird little poem. There's another story in a saga, Gautrek's saga, the most interesting parts of which are not about Gautrek, where a uh, Viking ship 
is becalmed, to use the older English word that I find somehow fun to say, becalmed on a small island and they cannot get a good wind to sail away. And uh, there is a king on this ship and the king and his men cast lots. We're not told exactly how, but it could be runes, it could be some other system for divining the future of the gods' will. But they cast lots to see how they can get a favorable win. And uh, the lot said, kill the king. <laughs> the king's like, all right, that's clearly an error here. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, best two out of three. <laughs> right. So they recast their lots and again, kill your king. So, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, let's sleep on it. So overnight, um, there is a man uh, on the ship who was fostered by an individual who uh, he remembers as an old man dressed in gray with a white burnt hat and a long gray beard and one eye, uh, who called himself Horsehair Whisker. Cross horse granny. A lot of Odin's weird pseudonyms. By the way, the one that he, he, he gives the slaves, the nine slaves in the field, says, my name is Bolvecker, evil doer. <laughs> I trust this guy. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I voted for him. <laughs> I voted for worse. Um, but he, uh, let's see, yeah, so, so horse here, whiskers. So he takes this guy over to another island, rows him over, and there's a council of 12 uh, who are apparently gods. And this guy sits down, the horse here, whiskers, sits down in this council. And Thor is there too, and Thor addresses horse here with Sirius Odin. So Thor is just going to crash. Lost funds, actually. But uh, they start talking about this fellow that Odin has fostered. This is Starkader, one of many Starkaders. And uh, Odin says, you know, I like this guy. He's, he's my man. And Thor says, well, I don't. He's he's kind of a, he's kind of stuck up, and his mom, uh, you know, I, I, she wouldn't let me have have my way with her. And uh, Odin says, "Well, I like him, so I'm going to give him the lifespan of three mortal men." It's like, oh, okay. Well, Thor says, "All right, counter that. In each one of those three lifetimes, he's going to do something deeply shameful." Odin says, "All right. Well, he's going to own." Um, all of the fine weapons and clothes that a man would want to have. You know, and this is showing in, you know, Odin's kind of the higher status, higher class guy, of course, as well, but he'll never own land, right? Which is what your average middle class farmer would want. Odin says, well, he's going to be a wonderful poet in kind of upper class pursuits. Of course, well, he'll never remember a line of his poetry. <laughs> and it goes back and forth like this with Odin blessing him and Thor cursing him. And when they go back to the, the horse here, whisker of Odin, Rose Stark got back to the island where the king and the other calm men are. And he says, you're gonna pay me back for these favors I just bestowed on you. <laughs> so I <this> is yes. <laughs> I see where this is going. Um, and he hands him a reed, right, like a swamp plant. And he says, tomorrow, I think you'll know what to do with this. Something to that effect. So in the morning, Sarkhada goes to the king, Vikar, and he says, all right, king, I think I've got a plan for how we can satisfy the gods. He said we should kill the king, right? So let's mock sacrifice you. And so we've just killed a calf. Right? This is one thing you'll notice. If you read about, uh, like if you read the Vinland sagas, uh, the saga of Vinland or saga of Eric the Red, when they are making their explorations in Greenland and subsequently in what's now northeastern Canada, they always have livestock on their ships, right? And I think that's something that we often forget in our visualization of Viking ships is they've got, you know, their herds with them because they've got to eat. And there's no McDonald's. Um, and uh, so they've just killed a calf, and so they have the soft guts of this calf. So, so let's hang you with the soft guts of the calf. And there's this low little tree right here, you know, the, the branch. Uh, we're going to hang you from this right above your head, so you're not going to drop from it. Uh, we'll put you up on the stump, just to get you a little bit closer to that branch there. 
And uh, I'll throw this reed at you instead of a spear. And uh, the king says, okay, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Symbolic sacrifice, I like that. Certainly like that better than real sacrifice. So they set the king up with the uh, soft cow guts around his neck. And Starkhunter reaches back to throw this reed at him, but as he does, he says, New Gedek Thick Ogni. Now I give you to Ogni. And he throws the reed and it turns into a spear and it punctures him. The stump falls away, the tree shoots up into the sky, and the Kafka turns into an actual rope, so he is stabbed and hanged. Odin gets his way. And then the wind picks up. <laughs> so they're good. But notice that he is stabbed with a spear and hanged. So what is the most famous story in Odin, the poem narrated by Odin? Well, do you like my old nurse readings or is it an unnecessary addition? Yes. Supposedly my voice changes when I speak old Norse. Does that, does that happen? I've heard that, okay. So Odin says in Sansa 138, let's see if I can do it on memory. Veit ek at ek hek vind ga nevi o matr allar niv gerve undagar o kevin ufn silver silver mer. O thing navy er man give it worse han of rotun ren. I know that I hung nine whole nights, wounded by a spear, and given to Odin, myself to myself, on that tree whose roots grow in a place no man has ever seen. So the king is sacrificed in the exact same way that Odin sacrifices himself to himself. <laughs> right, which I think is really like to me. This gets to the absolute crux of why Norse myth continues to fascinate people, because it poses you these questions and it never answers them. What does it mean to sacrifice yourself to yourself? Right? What does he die? Right? I mean, like I think that's a really interesting question about this scene. Does he die when he sacrifices himself to himself? Does he come back? I think it kind of implies that he dies, because I don't know how you could hang for nine days with a spear through you. Notice, by the way, that the word he uses for hang is veit ek atek hek. Hek is the past tense singular of the very common verb hanga. It means the exact same thing as English hang. It doesn't imply that he hangs upside down or by his arms or anything like that. He hangs by the neck. There's no reason to think he hangs some weird way. I think he dies. And so it looks like what he's doing there is he sacrificed himself exactly the same way that he would have someone else sacrifice to him in order to trust. Uh, the story of Gautrick Saunders reflecting some real, some real um, tradition. By the way, the stanza right after that, stanza 139, I'm always a little bit shaky on remembering this, but I think it's, the book's right there, but I like seeing it if I can remember the thing. Um, with Hornigy, I always trip up on something here. Let me make sure that I'm not misquoting this. With Lady Nixildu, Ne with Hornigy, Nusta Ek Nether, Name of Aruna. So no one gave me food, no one gave me a drink, a horn, a drinking horn, right? I peered down, I took up the runes, screaming, I took them, and then I fell. So does he fall perhaps into hell, into the realm of the dead? I think it's possible. But it's just as intriguing in a way that that story, which intrigues the hell out of people today, is told only there. Nowhere else do we hear about Odin's self-sacrifice. It's hinted at a little bit. Lots of poets call him the hanged god. Um, it's also, my, I think my favorite version of this is uh, the, uh, the, the, the burden of the gallows. <laughs> um, he, it, it's, it's clearly sort of known that he's done this, but it's interesting that Snorri doesn't tell this story. No one else ever repeats the story in detail, and yet it kind of haunts uh, his depiction elsewhere in the Eddas and Sagas. And his willingness to sacrifice himself or parts of himself is always there, right? I mean, why is he one-eyed? And it's not as in the Marvel movies that he just loses it in battle somehow. Like, I'm not actually very clear on how he would just like, randomly lose an eye while fighting Jotnar, I don't know. It's, not clear how that was supposed to happen in the Marvel movie. But the, uh, the version that we read uh, from Snorri 
is that he went to the well of this individual, Mimir, who is just a head. We, uh, we only meet him as a head who lives in a well. And uh, Mimir is fantastically wise, and whoever drinks from the waters of his well, Mimis Purundar, which is at the roots of Yggdrasil, the great tree, uh, will become wise. Well, Odin's always trying to learn more stuff because he wants to learn more about how he can prevent his death. Right? Maybe there's something in Mimir's wisdom that'll give me a little bit of information about how I can forestall Ragnarok, how I can maybe lock up Fenrir more effectively, how I can maybe get more men for life, whatever. Right? He's, he's obsessed with learning more. But Mimir says, well, the price is you have to give me an eye. Odin's apparently willing to do it. Right? You know, there's no, no indication that he pauses or hesitates. We go from you know, the sentence, well, you will have to leave me an eye as a pledge to Odin left him in the eyes of the <laughs> And uh, this detail was very well known as the uh, Volva, the Cirrus or Witch who narrates Volva's fall, taunts Odin, it seems to me, a little bit at several points in that poem. But one of the ways she taunts him is saying, Odin, I know where you hid your eye in the well of Mimir. Mimir can drink from that water every day where your eye drowns, which I think is just an interesting little a touch of poetry that, you know, again, just, they have weird, eerie ways of putting it, you know, where your eye drowns, right? not just where it bobs up and down. There's something interesting about that, like kind of a reminder that, in a sense, part of him is dead in that well. Right? Odin's very, very willing to do this sort of thing. By the way, it is never revealed which eye it is. So people ask me that sometimes. Is his left eye or his right eye? I don't know. I hope it's whichever one is not his dominant eye. <laughs> right. I think we all have a dominant eye. I definitely do. It's like, I would definitely be able to choose. Please never make me choose. <laughs> and, you know, you look at the major gods of the Pantheon, and I think it's really interesting to note that all of them are injured in some ways somewhat like this. Heimdall is apparently missing an ear. The Volva and Voluspa hints that he uh, has left his his fjol, that's what she says. That means hearing, but it's in the same stanza that she says Odin has left his eye there. Heimdallr has left his hearing there, but Snorri says that Heimdallr has fantastic hearing. So I think the implication is Heimdallr fjol. Note that it alliterates both with H. Is his is his ear that must have been left there. So maybe Heimdallr has also voluntarily given up an ear, but Tyr has voluntarily given up a hand. When they imprison Fenrir, the wolf will eventually kill Odin. Uh, before they put the chain on Fenrir that will actually hold him, Fenrir says, well, one of you has to put his hand in my mouth as a pledge that this chain won't actually bind me until Ragnarok. Tyr puts his hand in the wolf's mouth, and the wolf bites his hand off. So in a sense, he's also voluntarily sacrificed a body part. Um, but then Thor and Loki also were permanently maimed. Right? The gods live a long time. They're immortal in that sense, but they're very vulnerable to injury, and their injuries last. All right, so Thor has a duel with Hrungnir, uh, one of the Jotnar, giants, I think I've ever turned to burn English, um, where part of that this, this Hrungnir fights with a whetstone as a weapon, and the whetstone is shattered by Thor's hammer Njolnir during the fight, but a piece of it gets embedded in Thor's head, so he has a permanent bit of shrapnel on his head. And then Loki has his lips sewn shut. Um, he rips it open, but supposedly his mouth is very ugly. In fact, I think it's exactly the story. I'll start to it. His mouth is quite ugly. <laughs> um, kind of judgmental about these things, too. Of course, he's a shape changer, so what does it matter? I guess he can change to something else, but in his default form is his, his mouth is injured. And I think that, that's ex that this is another part of what draws people to Norse mythology, is that you're looking at gods who are in, in pain, right? It's not just that they're going to die. It's that they wake up every morning with reminders of that mortality that's coming and reminders that they're not whole and that they've had to do things. Well, look, you didn't have to do <laughs> what he did. But the other ones, in a sense, had to do something that resulted in this permanent maiming, right? They wake up with aches, pains, and loss, and they lose their friends and family too, right? 
Oh, then Lewis, is his son Balder, who he didn't want to die. We'll have to do like a Balder day, because there's so much to do with that story. That's such an interesting little, little vignette. And I think that that haunting sense of ongoing loss is in a sense a much more thematically interesting and distinctive thing about Norse myth than just the fact that there's a cataclysm at the end. Right? Lots of mythical and religious systems have some kind of cataclysm at the end. But often it's you know very whole gods going out to fight against their enemies who are sort of lower than they are. Um, the gods are going out already cut up, right? To face enemies who are always described as stronger than they are, and often described as even like better looking than they are. <laughs> it's like a love. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how Lucas <laughs> the Edison song is be. Um, and I think that's another thing the Marvel movies really screw up is people's perception of, of the enemies of the gods because they portray them as these weird, like, blue-looking mutant things. But they look like people, just like the gods do. Um, and in fact, some of them are among supposedly the most attractive beings in the cosmos. What do you think? Questions, remarks, criticisms, complaints, manifestos at this juncture? <laughs> Did Odin hang upside down? Wrong. No. No? There's no reason to think that. Well, he reached into me, me which would be the well. But not at the same time. No. It's not the same story. Mimir doesn't come up in all the moment. I think the reason no one ever realizes it's Odin is because they don't know which eye is the one he hits you up. <laughs> so he, they, they, he always knows which one they think it is, and he switches it to the other one. <laughs> I like this. So there's like a bolo out on Odin. <laughs> and it says, it's like elderly man missing left eye. People are like, well. <laughs> this, this guy's missing his right eye. There's no way. There's, 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 there's every time Thor sees him, Thor grew up and was like, or was like you know, his left eye's missing. <laughs> yeah, on, right. On the boat, it was a right, was a right eye old man. It's like, it has to be different. <laughs> <laughs> Do I call Oscar 911? <laughs> I mean, he's missing his right eye. Like, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Is this his name is Evildoer? <laughs> <laughs> it all checks out. Yeah, it's like, ah, uh, oh, come on, man. Like, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a living fossil, right? I'm a dead skin cell on the very outside of the body that is the human species, soon to be shed and replaced by more vibrant viewers. <laughs> As my brother put it. <laughs> And I remember the 1990s. <laughs> and uh, when I was a kid, for whatever reason, see if any of you remember this. Um, in the 1990s in the Denver area, what everybody played was not Dungeons and Dragons, but the Palladium Books games. Oh, yeah. Okay, I hear a pained, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. These are, they, were, they were all like different genres of RPGs. You know, they had like their basic fantasy one. They also had a superhero one. And there was a, I remember there was a minor superpower that always struck me that Odin has. And the minor superpower was called um, Forgettable. And it was just that nobody remembers. <laughs> this is a superpower, right? I wish I had that around Thanksgiving. <laughs> like, don't invite me anywhere. <laughs> um, Okay, very good. This is a good place for us to pause for a moment, gather our thoughts. I'll smoke a little bit more of my cigar in the back. Enjoy the cherry kwasir. I'm told it's very good. I can't drink myself. But uh, yeah, we'll return to this in a few minutes. <laughs> So if I ask you for a number between one and ten in the context of Norse myth, what are you going to answer? Nine. Nine. Right. 
So on a scale of one to 10, how much tolerance do you have for my self-indulgent crap in the second half of this? <laughs> okay, what's the real answer? <laughs> Five? Seven? Okay. I won't get into too much, but I promise there's a real connection here. I'm gonna start and end this with a little bit of self-indulgent crap, but it really has a point. All right. I am a pale facsimile of a greater human being. So I, when, when my girlfriend says that I'm, I'm too mean to myself, maybe that's true. Um, but when she first came to my apartment, she remarked to me, there are pictures of only one human being in here, your grandfather. And I looked around and I said, you know, you're right. I have never thought about that. The only person who's pictured someone was my grandfather. I loved him to death, and uh, in a lot of ways, I am kind of a pale facsimile of him. Uh, he was a great man. He uh, was a P-38 pilot in World War II. Came back and uh, was a mining engineer in Moy of Utah, and uh, retired to the mountains west of Denver, where I uh, grew up largely at their house. And uh, his and my grandmother's wisdom were a major guiding factor in my life and the good decisions that i have made have always comported with their wisdom the bad decisions that i have made i'm often able to look back and say they warned me about this <laughs> often to my own hurt and uh, you know what set them up as wisdom figures to me and I realize in a lot of ways, I think the people we look to for wisdom are the people who have suffered, right? You know, if you want wisdom, you don't walk down, you know, the street here in Loveland and, you know, stop some teenager on a skateboard and say, share me some wisdom, <laughs> right? You seek out the people who have seen things, who have lived through a lot of life. That doesn't necessarily mean old, it can be, I think it's often part of it, but as Indiana Jones says, it's not the years, it's the mileage, right? And they had a lot of mileage. And I think Odin too is a figure who has a lot of mileage. He also literally has a lot of years. He's the old, he's, he might not be the oldest living being who is still alive in the mythic present, but he's one of the oldest, right? He's old enough to remember the oldest because he killed him. <laughs> and I think there's an interesting duality in Odin. You know, we, we, we talked in the first half of this about Odin as this fickle, violent character, but he is also the main source of wisdom in the, the Norse mythos, right? What is Haldemald? Modern Icelandic pronunciation, Haldemald. People get on me about this a lot. I know. <laughs> what is, what is Haldemald about? It's about wisdom. Even though in this very poem he says, who can trust Odin? The wisdom is profoundly practical. But the wisdom also includes some stuff that we wouldn't call wisdom. So let's talk about some poems other than all them all to start with and look at the many things meant by wisdom in the, the context of Odin and Norse myth more broadly. The Norse language has a multiplicity of words for intelligence and learning. Right, Froder, Spacher, Vis, uh, just the first ones are Vitter. Four come to mind really fast. And they don't really actually have shades of meaning between them. They all mean roughly the same thing. Uh, I'm not just saying that it's a matter of impressions. I've studied this question. I've looked for differences, right? I've made databases. Like when, when, are, they, when are they saying somebody's Froder versus when are they saying somebody's Vitter? And there really isn't a difference. The same person's called this different word, different paragraphs. But by the same token, they use all of these same words about everything from the most practical wisdom for daily life, um, but also about like weird riddling trivia, right? The same word is used about all of these things. They don't really distinguish between uh, wisdom, cunning, intelligence, cleverness, knowledge, it's all kind of the same thing. And so all of it kind of gets wrapped up in the same Tent and Putin is an example, an exemplar of all of them. So, if you read through the poetic, first four poems: you have Wolfsbane, 
which tells about the creation and destruction of the world. You have Hall of which is just Odin narrating his wisdom as well as some stories about himself. And then you have Bob Thick and Small and Karim the Small, two poems of Odin going in disguise to someone else's home and sharing not what we would call wisdom, but what they will still call wisdom, more like mythological trivia. So in Karim the Small, Odin goes to the court of a king uh, that he had favored in, in his youth. Uh, the king does not remember him. <laughs> and this time, that backfires on Odin because he has been warned by a messenger sent by Odin's own wife uh, that he should distrust a man that no dog will attack. <laughs> so, I love this as a test. Just like, uh, just like my dogs and all my guests. And uh, the, one I, <laughs> the ones who get bit, um, they get hospitality. And the ones that don't, I don't trust them. I imprison them between two fires. But the king's son takes pity on, on Odin in disguise and brings him a drink of mead. And Odin says, you will never receive a better repayment for one drink of mead. And he starts telling him about all the different realms. Odin seems to go into, we started this by talking about association of his name with words like an ecstatic state, he seems to go in kind of an ecstasy, where he's just flying mentally over all the different realms, and he says, this is the hall that this god owns, this is the hall that this god owns, this is Yggdrasil, these are the deer that eat its leaves, this is the squirrel that goes up and down its, its trunk and takes insults from the snake that chews it at its roots to the eagle at the top and brings the insults back from the eagle to the snake. Um, he says, these are the names of the Valkyries, these are the 80 names of Odin, is how he concludes. By that point, the young man realizes who he's talking to, because Odin is talking in the first person. He says, I am called, and then he just goes, yeah, and old in a very, uh, very archaic form of, of um, the verb for I am named, I am called, or I call me. It lists, I think it's 80 different names, some of which we know from other stories, some of which whatever stories they're from are, are lost. Um, and then, uh, by the way, fulfilling his role as a harvester of men, the, uh, the king realizes who's talking, I guess he's been like, eavesdropping on this for a while, and he's like, oh man, have I made a mistake? <laughs> and he realizes at the end that this is Odin, he has made a mistake, so he gets up from his throne to release his prisoner, and as he does, his sword falls out of its scabbard, and he trips and falls on his sword. And, dies. and Odin concludes by saying, and now Odin has another weapon to kill man. So you have to be killed by weapons to get a ball. Um, Bob Thurkin's Law is a little bit similar. Um, Odin is talking to his wife, Frigg, and he says, you know, I hear that nobody knows more and this Jotun named Bob Rutnir, uh, whose name I rendered, because people have a hard time with this name, I don't know why, uh, people, but I render it in my uh, English translation for it as Riddle Weaver. Uh, it's, it's, his, his name literally is Bob, like web, Rutnir, strengthener, like tire of wood, strengthener, like it's like a spider wood metaphor, but I thought Riddle Weaver was kind of a nice English encapsulation of a similar metaphor there. He says, I hear nobody knows more than Bob Rutnir, and uh, Frick says, oh, don't go, <laughs> don't go testing wisdom against this guy. Um, and he says, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bet my head against this guy that I know more than he knows. Frick says, don't do it. And then he says, I'm going to go do it. <laughs> so Odin shows up at Bob Thurkin's Hall. And uh, he says, hey, my name is Goggin Roller, the well-advised or good advisor. Um, and I hear. You've got a head full of wisdom. Bob Hooper says, nobody wiser. He says, well, I'm going to bet my head, which literally means off the head of the person who loses, um, that I know more than you do. So they start asking each other questions and answering each other's questions. And so Kareem the Small, that wanders all over the realms. Bob the Small wanders all over time. So actually, a fair amount of the information that Snorri draws on the prose out about creation comes from Bob the Small. And then a fair amount of what we learned about Ragnarok when it comes to Bob the Small. But then how does Odin end it? He says, all right, <laughs> last question. What did Odin speak in the ear of Baldur on Baldur's funeral pyre? 
world does it have in his Parkinson's? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows this but Odin. And so Vatsuki realizes who he's competing against. He says, oh. Now I realize I have competed in wisdom against Odin, and no one but you knows that. And so by implication, I guess Odin gets to cut this out a little bit. get that narrated here. But Odin pulls that same trick in another place, a little bit less well known. Um, in this book, Two Sagas of Mythical Heroes, my uh, fourth uh, book published by Hackett, I have uh, translated the Saga of Hereborn Hadra, which is a really neat, fast paced short saga. And when I say fast paced, I, mean, I actually think that it would make a decent action movie. Um, they won't do it because, um, I don't know, it was never a comic book. <laughs> but, but it's a crazy story. I mean, it's got this, this woman who grows up thinking that her dad is some lame dude. And then she finds out that her dad was actually Anguntir, this famous berserker with a magic sword. She's like, oh man, this is my legacy. So she disguises herself as a man, uh, somehow gets a Viking crew, goes to the island where her dad died, digs up his digs into his burial mound, wakes up his zombie, and they have this just absolute rock opera exchange <laughs> in this poem called The Waking of Angantir, where she says, you know, give me the sword. He says, oh, it's cursed. And, you know, the guitar's just screaming. Because <laughs> you know, the sword is cursed. Um, anytime that it's drawn, it, it, it has to kill before it can come back in the sky. Cursor feature, depending on your perspective. <laughs> uh, but then the saga follows um, uh, her children, too. So she has a son uh, named Hadrick. She has two sons. Uh, I kind of love this because there's, there's a really, uh, this, this, is, this is such a Norse trope. You have two brothers. One will have lighter colored hair. He'll be very popular. The ladies will love him. He'll be just a cheerful dude. And then the other will be darker here. Uh, women won't like him. Uh, he'll be kind of grumpy. Um, and just, yeah, people, people don't like him. So it's exactly like my brother and me. <laughs> um, yeah. But her, uh, her, her less likable son, Hate Ragger, uh, is brought up by, you know, my dad's nobody's seen before, right? My little, you know, he's fostered and see where this is going. Um, but he's a very potent hero because he's so much trouble to his parents that not only do they send him away to be fostered, but they don't invite him to his popular brother's birthday party. <laughs> but he finds out about it anyway and he shows up. And at the birthday party, he's sitting between two other guests and he starts telling you know, the two guys, hey, this guy over here, he says, you know, this is your mom's pretty ugly. Hey, you know, this guy over here, do you hear what he said? Anyway, he gets them fighting and one of them kills the other and so like, well, you've got to leave this party. It's <laughs> <laughs> another thing that I kind of love about these stories is the penalties are so, <laughs> so ridiculous compared to the crime. So I was like, well, you made someone murder someone else, you're going to have to leave again. <laughs> <laughs> right. But this happens in, with the gods too, because in Locus and in the Poetica, Loki straight up murders a servant because, quote, Loki hates to hear servants praised, off quote. <laughs> and they say, leave. <laughs> but um, as Hadrick is leaving the party, he's you know, kicking the dirt. Oh, gee whiz. You know, my parents suck. Uh, and he picks up a rock and he throws it back at the tent where the party's happening in a skirt y'all. And it hits his brother in the head and kills him. <laughs> so his dad says, I'm going to banish you, son. And his mom says, No, this is the son I hope best. Um, I'm going to give you this magic sword, the one that kill, has to kill before you back into its scabbard. Uh, so she gives him the sword, and then his dad gives him some advice that he breaks. And anyway, I mean, we're not here to talk about the saga, but that would be a fun night. Maybe it's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, but he goes on to be a king in his own right. And later in his life, uh, he is prosecuting a man in his kingdom. He goes on to be be a king himself. He's got a legal case against a man in his kingdom named Gestum Belindi. So, Gest is Gest, 
cleaned, it's blind, so the blind guest um, sounds like a very odin -y name. And in fact, Odin comes to Guest Room Blindy, and one time, or it's like two times that Odin actually disguises himself as another person. He disguises himself as Guest Room Blindy and goes in his place to Haithrecker's court. And um, he says, okay, well, so I know I'm gonna lose my case. I mean, you've, the prosecution's got me tied up here, but um, I know that in your kingdom, there are two appeals courts. Uh, one appeal court is the pig. Uh, you can appeal to a magic pig, who apparently, I'm not making this up, stomps with one hoof for guilty and with another hoof for not guilty. I think that's pretty amazing. But there's also, and God, I wish Larry County did this. Um, there is the riddles appeal court. And so, so we will propose each other riddles. And if you can't answer one of my riddles, then um, we're gonna, then, then I get to go free. So, and these are in fact all but, I think it's all but one riddle preserved in Old Norse is just in this exchange between Odin, this guy's disgusting and Blinken, hit record. So it's called the riddles of Gaston Blinken. A lot of them are actually kind of fun. A lot of them are blindingly stupid, actually. Um, <laughs> but, but a lot of them are really fun. Uh, one of my favorites is, um, uh, let's see if you can get this one. What has 10 feet, three eyes, and one tail? Odin riding snake me up. Exactly, nice, yes. <laughs> so Odin, because he's one eye, riding his horse with his eight legs. <laughs> kind of cool, right? I think that's a good one. Um, there's another one that's like, a dead thing rode a dead thing on ice to the sea. What did I see? And Hedrecker says, like, oh, that's a dead worm on a dead horse on an ice floe on a river. It's like, yeah, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how does Odin win this one? He says, all right, <laughs> what did Odin whisper in Baldur's ear at Baldur's funeral pyre? <laughs> Nobody knows this. Um, so, Haidrecker draws his sword, the magical sword that has to kill before he can go back into the scabbard, and strikes at Odin, but Odin turns into a hawk. And so the sword actually just brushes the hawk's tail feathers. This is why hawks have short tails. There's not many just so stories in Old Norse. <laughs> By the way, they must be talking about a European hawk, because that's where hawks are favorite long tails. But whatever. Um, and Odin says, well, for that, for striking at me, I curse you to be killed by the lowest slaves. So sure enough, uh, some of this guy's own slaves kill him. Uh, anyway, but that kind of thing, you know, these, these riddles in Saga of and Hadrick, the information about creation of Ragnarok and Vathu the Small, the information about the different realms and the different names of Odin. This is all wisdom from a Norse perspective. They don't distinguish between these as different sorts of things. In fact, the, what, what I'm calling a real contest, in the text it's just called a wisdom contest. Yes, the contest of wisdom, of what the dead thing, of the dead thing, <laughs> on the ice thing. But of course, the ultimate expression of Odin's wisdom is in all of which I think is just one of the most fascinating texts in any language. I have come back to this thing for my entire life. I always find it just endlessly fascinating text. And I, I had uh, an honor I'll share with you. Uh, I was asked, uh, the University of Iceland has recently produced a new encyclopedia of Icelandic literature. I had the honor of uh, writing the article on Hallmark for that. Uh, it was really cool. I was, I was blown away to be asked to do that. So I think that's appearing later this year or early next year. So it's a text I, have, I just have a, a deep appreciation for, and I can talk to you at great length about it. Um, Hall Mall is also, it fascinatingly stands alone. If you read through the Poetica from the first page of Old Spall to the last page of Hamdus Mall, and you pay attention to the language of the text, there is one poem that stands out as definitely not coming from the same place, and it's Hall Mall. It has linguistic features that are unique, it's written in a dialect that looks old Norwegian, but doesn't share um, all of its features with any known Norwegian dialect, so it looks like it's from a very, some, some weird corner of Norway. It has um, 
references to the physical world that placed its original composition in Norway rather than Iceland. The world that it talks about socially is Norway rather than Iceland. It's clearly something that has been brought over by Norwegian settlers in Iceland, which isn't surprising, but it helps us date it. Right? Nor Nor Norwegian settled Iceland in the late 800s, right, during the reign of King Harald Fairy. Again, advanced naming technology. <laughs> And, well, so by the way, just so you know what I'm, sort of what I'm talking about, uh, physical world, talks about wolves, trees, things, things you never see in Iceland. Uh, social world, it's always talking about princes and kings. Again, things you don't encounter in Iceland, which is kind of a proto-republic in the Viking Age, early Middle Ages. And it is also clearly not originally one single poem. It is sewn together out of six or seven different things. So the part that people mostly think about when they think about Hald Mall is the first 80 stanzas or so, which we traditionally refer to separately as Gesta Faltar, the guest's part. Uh, because it starts out by Odin talking about, it's, it's, it's kind of a weak framing device that falls apart after 10 or 12 stanzas. But to begin with, it's the, we have this picture of a wanderer who's knocking on doors and seeking hospitality and the kind of wisdom that he needs, but also the kind of wisdom that his host needs. And there's a very strong emphasis on moderation, right? Don't talk too much, but don't be silent. Don't drink too much, but don't not drink. Don't be stupid, but don't be too wise. And there are three famous, well, within this field of ventures, three famous stanzas in a row where he says, uh, be wise, but never too wise, and then offers some thoughts about what's wrong with being too wise, including that a wise man's heart is seldom glad. <coughs> and also that uh, you, uh, as you get wiser, you can see your future more clearly, and you don't want that, which, <laughs> thousand yards of here. <laughs> um, and it is an amazingly secular text. Right? The first hint that we have of anything out of the ordinary in our daily lives, anything that you couldn't translate into just about any other culture's field of reference, is in stanza 80 when he finally says something about runes. But from stanzas 1 to 79, we hear nothing about the afterlife, even. Right? You die. Right? What's the most famous stanza? Do you have do you have friend or do you have some? A cow dies. You know, cousins die. Friends die. Depends if you want to get his relatives or friends. You yourself die the same way. I know one thing that never dies: the judgment on each dead man. But that's the judgment of the living. Right? He says that um, a deaf man can still be a herder. Right? A blind man can still be a speaker. Right? The only thing that's good for nothing is a dead man. Right? It's, a, it's very much about this life. And then uh, he transitions from that into a part that we traditionally call Demi Odin's, Odin's examples. Uh, this is mostly about how men shouldn't trust women, uh, with a footnote about how women shouldn't trust men. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's some, some but one thing that I really like about Haldemol is how concrete all the metaphors are, right? It never uses abstract terms. He's always going back to physical descriptions of things, to exemplify his points. So he says, for example, that women's hearts are molded on a wobbly wheel. So it's a, it's a, a potter's metaphor, but you know, it's not going to be a symmetrical pot. Yeah, but seven senses later, he says, I know men and women both, men lie to women. So, and he says, in fact, that we speak most eloquently when we tell the biggest lies. So, I think he's probably right. Um, and then he tells two stories about his personal experiences with uh, love and mistrust with the opposite sex. He talks about a woman that he badly, badly wanted, and he talks about her very intimate terms, or at least he fantasizes about her in very intimate terms because he never gets her uh, name. Uh, Billings matter, which probably means daughter. It's literally girl of Billinger, probably implying her daughter. Some people think that it's supposed to be his wife. I think it's kind of his daughter, um, who he just badly wants to get with, and she keeps <laughs> putting him on. Right? She's 
she's the bumble date who's always sick. But um, she says, uh, you know, when he, when he first goes into her room, she says, oh, uh, I'll come back at nighttime because not as many people will see us at nighttime. He comes back at nighttime and uh, there's a bunch of men in her room with torches ready to chase him away. And then he comes back a second time, but she's got a guard dog there ready to you know, sound the alarm. So uh, some of, I mean, he can sound downright teenage except he's very eloquent in the way that those fingers are, um, about how that wise woman misled him in every way and he got no life for his trouble. But then he tells a second story, um, which I talked about a little bit the first time I was here in September, uh, about how he got the meat of poetry by seducing Gunlov, the daughter of Sötenger. Uh, and um, this story is actually quite different from the way the story is told in the prosa, which is interesting. It shows us that multiple variants of one story were being told in Iceland in the 1200s. Um, but after he's gotten the mead from her, and he says he left her weeping, uh, her father, Sotinger, comes to Oscar. They're looking for the man who seduced his daughter, right? Where's Boldberger? Where's Evil Doer? <laughs> well, no one's seen him. And uh, Odin reflects as the story ends. Um, I think that Odin swore an oath to him, but who can trust Odin? <laughs> and then he goes into a park called Lord Hoffman's Mall, where if you've ever read Hoffman's Mall, you have wondered uh, who he had copy paste 18 times, <laughs> because most standards in the section start with, I counsel you, Lord Hoffman, whoever that is, it's never mentioned anywhere else. I counsel you, Lord Hoffman, take my advice, I'll profit you if you learn it, etc. And he gives him some advice that's kind of practical, like in Hoffman's Mall, um, actually, one of my very favorite stanzas comes from this part where he says that uh, those inside don't know anything about the one knocking at the door. But I can tell you one thing, no man is so good that he has no flaw, no man is so bad that he's good for nothing. So you know that about the stranger at the door. He's neither perfect nor you know, totally flawed, or not totally worthless. I think that's a, just uh, wonderfully, uh, I don't know, What's the word? Charitable stanza from a text from a Viking age. Um, but he also gets into some more mystical stuff here, right? Don't trust witches. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to. <laughs> um, and then also gets into some territory that's earthier than the earlier part of Falcon Law. For example, he says, don't get up in the middle of the night unless you need to relieve yourself. Okay. Uh, then abruptly, we transition to uh, the part usually called Brunnhal, a cat of the runes. This is where uh, that stands that I read to you earlier about him hanging himself and learning the runes comes from. And then Ogmal wraps up with Yodatal, uh, a cat of the spells, in which Odin tells the 18, 18 spells that he knows. Um, but this is just him bragging, he doesn't teach us the spells. Right, he says, um, you know, I know a spell that will heal anyone of anything, I know a spell that will put out fires, I know a spell to calm storms, I know a spell to make women love me. Uh, I don't know why I didn't use it on Billings Mayor, um, <laughs> but that's meant for you. Um, and then one of my favorite parts about this is in stanza, this, not in stanza, but in the 18th spell, he says, and then there's the 18th spell, which I'll never teach anybody except maybe the girl that was sick with my sister. Um, I was like, well, you didn't teach us the first 17. <laughs> so why like, are you life-shaping at this point? Um, possibly, intriguing possibility, no way to verify this, but I've always kind of wondered if there's an earlier version of this in an oral tradition where maybe he did teach the first 17, but then the 18th is sort of left out. And who, who knows? But. Notice that the one thing that brings all of these together is, again, that broadly defined wisdom. It's not just practical advice for living. It's not just the relations of the sexes. It's not just runes. It's not just spells. It's all of these things. And what I believe is most likely is that a medieval editor, probably in some forgotten corner of Norway at some point, maybe in the 1100s, but I believe it was a medieval editor who thought all these kind of go together. They're all Putin's wisdom one way or another and wrote them out as one poem called Hovmal. It is called Hovmal in the manuscript. Not all the poems are given a title in the manuscript. <coughs> and then 
whoever so whoever made our manuscript of the poetic editor, Cody Regis manuscript that's housed at the University of Iceland, um, which by the way, it's always surprised people is about this big. It's only the size of like a small, small print book. Um, whoever so the copyist who made that manuscript copied all the other poems out of a different manuscript that Hawthorne was copied out of. The spelling is consistently different, even in some very common words. So there's something interesting happened here in the way this was brought together with the other poems. But he thought that it belonged there, obviously because of the connection with the God. And anyway, I've been thinking about this poem for a long time, and I first encountered it in Believe It or Not, before I ever was particularly interested in anything Norse related. In seventh grade, I had a class called Adolescent Literature, <laughs> which was mostly a class where you slept. Um, <laughs> but the idea of the class was you would read in it. So most people would either slept or they just brought in whatever book they were reading. But the teacher of this class, for good or ill, decided that she was going to make kind of a project out of me. It was like, you're going to read a bunch of classics. All right, whatever, sure, fine. And among the books she had me read was, uh, see if any of you remember Edith Hamilton's mythology? Old school, yeah, I see, I see, I see one recognized back there. Classic little book from the 50s, mostly about Greek and Roman myth, but at the very end she has an appendix about Norse myth. And, um, you know, it intrigued me at the time. Part of what I thought was fascinating was she said, you know, she, she says up front, I don't read Old Norse. And these stories confuse me. <laughs> she said, I don't know if that's a feature of Old Norse or a feature of the translations. It's a feature of Old Norse. Uh, it's a feature of the originals anyway. Um, but part of what she shares is some quotes from that first part of Hawthorne. And I'm sitting there in my seventh grade classroom, and I can't help but read in this English translation, like, this is my grandfather. It sounds exactly like it. Right, this practical advice with these really concrete examples, the sort of subtle belittling that kind of comes with, like not, not in a mean way, but like some of the stanzas are just, just a little bit belittling, right? Um, he says, cows know when it's time to go home and stop eating, but stupid people don't. <laughs> it's kind of, you know. Um, but there's also this element of just personal experience, of, again, the sufferer, right? That he's, he's gotten wisdom through suffering. He says, uh, when he's talking about how you shouldn't drink too much, it pauses in one sentence and says, I've been drunk. I've been too drunk. Right? I mean, this is, a, this is someone who has been there. He's not handing this, he's not pointing at you from a high place and saying, don't do these things, you know, embrace purity and, and, and imitation of me. It's not a poem for a, a black and white world. It's a, poem for people who have made mistakes by someone, even though he's set up as a god who has made those mistakes. And that just fascinated me for whatever reason. I, I can't explain why I thought this was so awesome when I was 12. Um, so when I started to learn Old Norse, which believe it or not was in 2003, uh, that's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, the very first thing I wanted to do, I, I want to read, I want to see what this reads like in the original, and I want to know um, this poem well. And so it was the first thing that I ever read in its entirety in Old Norse, and um, it was part of what convinced me to embark on my translation project. So I just thought, well, no translation sounds like this, sounds like what it is, right? Because I feel like so many translations, they want to get this old fashioned style, the sort of Shakespearean sounding English, but it doesn't sound that old fashioned, most of it, from a 1200s perspective, if that makes sense. Right, it's kind of like the Bible, people expect that King James style, but if you read the New Testament and the original Greek, it's very contemporary Greek for its time. Um, but more importantly to me with all of them all was uh, even reading the Old Norse, I mean, my grandfather <laughs> no interest in my book in any of this stuff. Um, but I could not help but read even the old Norse stuff in his accent. Right? It's just like, God, it's him talking to me on this page. And so there was one night in January 2012, I read a blog post on a now defunct blog. I think defunct. 
from a Norwegian blogger who did this actually pretty impressive thing called Hollow All for Dummies. And he took every stanza of the, that first 80 stanza of the wisdom block of Paul Mall, um, and he turned it into one or two words in Norwegian. It's pretty good, right? So he takes a stanza about not talking too much and just says, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but it's it, like, that sounds sort of pat, but it's actually, it's, it's cleverly done. It's done by somebody who knows the text. And so I left a comment on this blog and said something like, you know, I really respect what you've done here, like you show a real awareness to this text. And he replies to me, who knows what inspired this? He said, yeah, and you know, I think only a Scandinavian could have this kind of relationship with the text. And I don't know, that rubbed me the wrong way. Just like, I don't know, buddy, I've got a relationship with this text. <laughs> and so I sat down uh, in the course of this one night, and I translated that 80 stanzas into what I call the cowboy album. And so it's actually rendered in, it, it is made to sound like my grandfather, right? It is made to read as he would have put things. Uh, including updating the cultural references from medieval to modern, so spears turn into guns, that sort of thing. Um, but to me, that is the most, I don't know, me thing that I've ever done. Um, so, that's what I mean by how my self-indulgent craft at the beginning comes back to self-indulgent craft at the end. Uh, I think there's a lot of timeless wisdom in all of them all, whether or not take an interest in Norse culture per se, it's actually a very culturally independent poem. It's not particularly Viking, if you will. The only stanza, and I really take an issue with people who call it a Viking code of ethics. It's like, I don't know. It's like about not drinking too much. These guys drink all the time. <laughs> like this is kind of a, I don't wanna say revolutionary, but it's somebody who's been through a lot, who's willing to disagree with this mainstream culture. Um, the one stanza that I think is, you know, kind of betrays its, its origins in a martial culture is, uh, get up early if you want to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably good advice. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, the lady who tried to break into my house because she thought that Steven Spielberg and I, <laughs> sorry, it tells you that she's crazy, uh, ran the CIA torture camps. Um, that was at 108 in the morning. So I guess she was sort of taking that advice. Um, but, yeah, think about checking out all of them. Not that I'm trying to sell you books, I mean, I sort of am. But um, <laughs> the poetic edit, and then my text called The Wanderers of Mall. This actually includes the Old Norse text, too, with the commentary. Uh, I was just talking to Craig here earlier before this talk about how anytime someone is presenting about this stuff to the public, whether in a translation or in a talk or YouTube video or whatever, there's always a sort of selective searchlight on some fact, like the, the least biased presenter is always going to present you things in the way he understands them. It's unavoidable, right? But I'd like you to at least also have the searchlight, right? I'd like to say, here's where you can find the searchlight. So the old Norse text is there if you want to call me on it and say, no, I disagree with you about this part or whatever. Like, I, you know, you go study it yourself. But the, the Cowboy Hall Mall wraps up, um, the poetic edit translation and the, the Mother's Hall Mall translation. So I'll take some questions and stuff, but I'll just wrap this up with how about a couple quotes from the Cowboy Hall Mall? How's yeah. that sound? Yeah. Yeah. Something just to give you a little flavor. Yeehaw. Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> just opening it to a, uh, a few random stanzas. Um, and this is, again, just meant to sound like Bob, how he might have said things. You're a goddamn fool if you think you'll live forever just because you won't fight. Say nobody ever kills you. Old age is no peach either. I'll say another thing about drinking. I swear I'm nearly done. But just you think how much dumber a dumb man is after a few drinks. Whoever heard more awful bullshit? <laughs> Travel. See the country. Never miss a chance to get outdoors. You'll only get smarter by knowing more people, more places, more ways to be a man. So, a little tricky to pop at the end of this. And uh, yeah, I'll take questions, comments, remarks, criticism, complaints, manifestos. As far as translating goes, um, do you, I mean, I obviously I assume there's no Old Norse dictionary, so is there, there is. oh, there is. Is it, 
I'd, I'd assume you take a lot of it from Icelandic and kind of compare to compare words and like, oh, this means this. And... Sure. Well, so modern Icelandic, um, there's a widespread conception that it's the same language as Old Norse. It isn't the same. It has changed. But there's a lot of continuity. The language is still much closer to the old language than, say, English is the old English. So the fact that there's a continuous tradition of reading Old Norse texts in Iceland means that we're not starting from scratch. Now, there are going to be words, there are going to be expressions, there's going to be idioms that aren't familiar from modern Icelandic. But there's a long tradition of scholarship even on all of those. So there's good dictionaries available. Um, in fact, uh, in 2024, uh, we're getting close to having the greatest resource ever made for reading Old Norse almost complete. Uh, the Dictionary of Old Norse Prose at the University of Copenhagen, which has been in development since 1989. Wow. Right? It's the OED of Old Norse. It is within a couple of years, I think, of being done. Um, and, they, and they have a fully interactive online interface you can use everything that's done. I think they're done through R, um, but they even have a lot of lawyer letters done in, in pieces too. So yeah, there's good resources out there. So to go back to an earlier topic, you mentioned, and you mentioned the Yurtsu that the Yoden are really, I mean, they're, they're interrelated with the gods. They are tied up with the gods. and They're seen as an enemy of mankind and the gods themselves, but they are related. Where did the concept that Yoden are giants come from? Yeah, my pet theory about this is, um, okay, the main word used in Old Norse is Yotin, which its actual etymology is related to the word eat. Okay, so think about this, think about these parallels. English Old Norse are closer to the language. Heart, hjarta, earth, jord. Okay, so very often where English is E-A, Old Norse is J-A or J hook O. Eat, yolt. They're actually talking about words. So the, the yolten is the eater. So whether this means that there's an early conception of them as something like cannibals, or we're just to understand them, and, and, and etymology isn't a clue always to how people understand it contemporaneously, but in origin, perhaps something like a notion of cannibals, or perhaps just you know, they have huge appetites or something, but not giant, not size, right? So um, I've always taken issue with the way that, that word giant misleads people. Um, for example, if you think about Skirnes and all four Skirnes, the poem in the Poetic Edda, where uh, Friar falls in love with a Yolten woman and courts her. I mean, I've seen popular portrayals of this, you know, where it's kind of played for laughs. Oh, this woman is 20 times bigger than he is. She's not. She's the same size as he is. She looks like a person, just like he does. They look like human beings. Um, some of them are ugly and misshapen and have like nine heads or something, but that's weird, right? That's not the typical thing. Um, the, the rivalry between the gods and their enemies is a rivalry between closely related people, which, I mean, I could do a whole talk about, about this, just about how families fighting among themselves is a huge theme of the Icelandic sagas, and it's in their myths too, right? Thor is constantly killing the parents of the very Yolten women that he's sleeping with, right? And Odin too. Um, Thor's mom is a Yeltsin, right? I mean, they, they're, yeah, they're closely related. Um, the term giant, I think the reason that comes into use is actually under the influence of classical men, because the enemies of the Olympian gods are the titans. So I think early translators want to kind of mimic that, and they introduce them as giants. So in my earliest translation efforts, like in the Poetic Guide published in 2015, I, I used giant just because everybody did. I, if, if that comes to a second edition, I'm probably gonna change that because it drives me crazy now. Um, when I did the Norse Mythology Codex for the Great Courses, which is another whole subject, um, I introduced another translation for this anti-god, which I kind of like. Plus, it, it sets them up as more parallel to one another. It's just good and bad, but all the, are the gods all good? Right, I mean, is Odin good? Right, no one loves Odin. Um, so I think God and anti-God is a little bit better. But yeah, I think it's actually the influence of classical myth that produced this notion of giant. And I don't know why they're blue and marble. Yeah. 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 Y
<laughs> so, so the influence of X-Men. I was gonna say, uh, I always think about in God of War 2018, when Kratos is like, well, why aren't the picture of these giants huge? And his sons of Trace is like, well, giant doesn't mean that they were big. They were just called giants. And I don't know why it's always, like, ever since I heard that, that's always what my mind goes to when I think of the old Yeah, but it's a false problem in Old Norse, right? Because yeah. they're not called giant. But now, there are huge beings. If you read the prose, uh, Thor and Loki um, travel to Utgard, the Loki's place, and there they meet truly huge beings. They can't fit through the, or, or they can, like, squeeze through the, the, uh, the gate at Utgard, the Loki's place, because you know, they're the size of mice compared to Utgard, the Loki, or whatever. That, like, there are truly huge beings, so that's a different word, it's a risi, mm -hmm. right, a risen one, so they're truly gigantic. Why do the, the focus today was on wisdom and being wise and riddles and a lot of thought power. Uh, I know it was associated with Vikings with more brutes, more warriors, um, with the culture of the Vikings, more intellectual or more warrior? Well, I think what you've got is just like our society, there's people of all walks of life. And even if you're a warrior, you're not a warrior year round. I mean, you still have to eat. There's not much division of labor in the society. So most of your warriors are farmers nine months of the year. And then in the summer, it's like, oh, let's go to England and steal stuff. Right? I mean, you know, they put all their expensive stuff in churches. Let's just go knock over a church. Um, they, I've compared it to. Uh, the mentality of a wolf pack. Wolves aren't evil to each other, but they're evil from the perspective of an elk. Right? They go and they feed on. They 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 have a very angry outward morality. Right? They will not accept uh, people doing to other Norse speakers, but they'll happily turn around and do to someone who speaks English or Irish. Um, it's it's also a it's a hyper-masculine society. I think that term is, is a, a decent one. Um, you know, much like other really martial societies, and I think good exemplars of this are the Lakota, the Aztec. Um, men are expected to be uh, aggressive in pursuit of their goals and, and aggressive in defense of their families. Uh, the law codes uh, actually uh, legalize a lot of this. Uh, you are legally obligated to avenge uh, physical strikes against you. Somebody hits me, I'm actually legally obligated to do something about that. It's not just optional. Um, and of course, the religion reinforces that because the only way to get into the good afterlife is to die by weapons. Um, so, you know, go out and die fighting because that's, a, that's how you get into the afterlife. It's not boring. So it's a very martial society, but I, but I think it also has a lot of other walks of life within it, if that makes sense. Yeah. The, the definition of weapon seems kind of interesting based off what you were saying. Just a couple of anecdotes, you're like, scythes are typically not a weapon or a tool, but he has those nine slaves kill mm -hmm. each other with their scythes and it counts in, it counts. in, <laughs> in his opinion. <laughs> I mean, like there's no list anywhere that says like, this is, like, this, this counts for Volvo. In fact, there's an interesting story, or a couple stories, in one of Snorri's works, Inglinga Saga, one of Snorri's less read uh, works, where he you hammerizes the gods, he turns the gods into just normal people who deceive people in worshiping them, but they like worship themselves at the same time. It's it's confusing, but I want to say Norther dies, but he dies in bed, but he has a spear drawn on him so he can go to Odin. <laughs> So he's weapon marked, is yeah. the word he used. Um, but there's also, it's interesting in the sagas, there is a disdain for fighting without weapons. So men start fist fighting, and people will break up that fight and say, don't fight like women. <laughs> right? you, get your spear, get your sword. Okay. Please, fight. Like, yeah, we're not trying to break up a fight per se. <laughs> it's like, this is, just, this is not dignified. Right. Fight each other with, with, with some kind of tool. Um, yeah, actually, so boxing, I guess you could say, has a low status with them, although wrestling is cool. <laughs> All right with that. Uh, if you've ever watched traditional Icelandic wrestling, which has roots in the Viking age, it's weird. 
<laughs> it's called Klima, G-L-I, accent mark, M-A, Klima, uh, and it involves two people standing, facing each other, it's awkward, um, holding onto each other's belt, and you have to keep your hands on the other person's belt to try to get them off the ground. Mm. Like sumo. Yeah, kind of sumo-ish. Um, I have a video on my channel where Ian McCollum, YouTuber behind Forgotten Weapons, he and I were in Reykjavik and we went to a Klima club. <laughs> we get thrown around a lot. Um, mostly by women. <laughs> so, that was an interesting experience. Just on the side. Um, so, I know, I know you worked on uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, and there's a particular part of the game called Flighting. Um, oh yeah, F-L-Y-T-I-N-G. Yeah, where they have like kind of word battles and kind of try to rhyme and stuff. Is that something that they would do a lot back in the day? Yeah, I, I actually kind of didn't like that they went with that word because that's not the Old Norse word, but it makes it kind of look like it's the Old Norse word. It's actually the Scottish term for the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like an older Scottish term, Kitsum. Um In Old Norse, it's called uh, Senna or uh, Ord Yatnother. So Senna means truth-telling, Ord Yatnother means like Measuring up the words. Yeah, they absolutely have rap battles. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an excellent parallel because they're insulting each other in much the same terms. I mean, actually, it's it's really culturally similar because, of course, it's an oral uh, art style. Yeah, and they're insulting each other in often really creative ways. And they often refer to the, the myths in pretty detailed ways. I mean, we're just talking in the back over there about, um, you know, when, when Odin steals. The meat of poetry from Sutinger. Um, it's the meat that will make you a poet if you drink from it. As he's flying away in the form of a hawk and he's being chased by Sutinger in the form of an eagle, he turns around to see how close the eagle is behind him and he realizes it's closer than he thought and he defecates in fear. <laughs> but since he's flying over Midgard, he actually defecates like over us. And so you'll see these poets saying to each other, You drank bird crap. <laughs> right? You're a bad poet. Right, you didn't drink the good meat, you drank the meat that was like pre-digested. <laughs> so there's lots of, of references to the myths that, that get wrapped up in these. And they can be, I mean, the, their poetry is amazingly elaborate. The rules for composing uh, Old Norse Skaldic poetry, their core poetry, it's, it is beyond difficult to do orally. I mean, I, if I can sort of do it like in English or Old Norse, but I have to sit down and like write out you know, line by line and figure out where my rhymes are just being my lyrics, it's, it's complicated. It's kind of hard to believe that people would actually just do it on the fly. But it's the same with rapping. I can't rap spontaneously, but some people can't. You, you practice it for a long time, you have kind of like a, a couple formulas that you go back to that you're ready to throw in. You know, I suppose it makes you more ready for it. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some of the sagas have amazing just amazing rap battles, as it were. Um, there's a saga called Bjarna Saga Heat de la Kapa, the saga of Bjorn, champion of the people of Hitterdal, where uh, this guy and his rival, um, you know, they hate each other because they love the same girl and she chose one of them. Um, they're constantly making poems by each other. It's <laughs> like, it gets like amazingly weird. Like, your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Mothers actually often come up as another pair of <laughs> You know, you're, uh, you're, well, your dad is a fish, basically. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so let me explain to you how you were conceding. <laughs> wow, this is, a, this is weird, guys. Um, but uh, I, I enjoy a lot of this one, too. And, and of course, the ultimate poet saga is uh, the saga of Hegel Skallagrim's song. That, that thing is full of poetry, which that saga, this is another interesting thing about, thing about their poetry. This is kind of wandering afield to the question, which is an aside. You know, these sagas are written down in the 1200s. They're mostly talking about the Viking Age, 800s, 900s. Hegel's poetry works, like the rhymes and alliterations, work better in 900s Old Norse than they do in 1200s Old Norse. It actually looks like, whatever the specific details of his story, it actually looks like this is real poetry people remembered for hundreds of years. And, and wrote down many hundreds of years later. So, and, and it looks like in many poems in the poetic era we're in a similar position where the language is more archaic than the, the, than the manuscript is written on. So you mentioned that um, Odin 
when he's debating with <coughs> Weaver that his trump card is when he mentions that, or when he asks, what did he whisper into Baldur's ear in his, in his funeral pile? And then in the saga of Candlelord and Hadrick, he does the same thing. The exact same words. When he's substituting in for the, the man who's being prosecuted, um, does he does he use that as a trump card in any other sagas? Is that kind of Odin's like ace in the hole for getting away with things? It's just those two places, but it's kind of remarkable that it's even those two places. Because, I mean, it's different manuscripts. They're written down 100 years apart. Um, it's the same word. It's the, the writer of the saga of Heroin Hedrick might have known about Duke and Small, uh, or might not have. I mean, these. When, when I say that people remember little formulas, that might have been a formula people remember. It's just like, this is, this is Odin's trump card. But there's another interesting example of these formulas coming off of different sources. Um, I quoted earlier the most famous quote from Alden other than him hanging himself. It's probably cows die, kinsmen die. That same, uh, it, that exact same couple lines is in Hawkeye Mall, the poem from the 900s about the death of King Hawkeye the Good. Uh, the poet says, cows die, kinsmen die, and everyone's going to die before there's a king as good as this one in Norway again. So certain phrases kind of seem to float around, people find places to put them. But I think that's true of our poetry, our, our songs, and such too. And I think sometimes there's a deliberate echo. That could be a deliberate echo. That could be somebody saying, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shout out about this. So I'm gonna give a little allusion here for people who are familiar with the Eddas. Um, because I'm gonna you know, show my, my culture cards here, but like you look at Outlaw Country today and those guys reference each other pretty often, right? I mean, I've, I've, I'm trying to think of the exact example because it came just a few days ago, but like Zach Bryan will straight up quote Turnpike Trooper's songs. And I don't think that he's ripping them off. I think it's like a illusion, right? I think it's, 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 they were drawn from a common source familiar to my audience right? for the pleasure of their, uh, you know, realizing the reference. And maybe that's actually what's happening at Hawkeye Mall. That could be quoting Hawkeye Mall. Odin went to just be win and be efficient with this whole you know, little thing. Why not just pull that, you know, what over uh, Odin whisper into the ear or whatever and just be done with it? Yeah, so that's the dream logic of myth, right? <laughs> These stories are never straightforward. If there's an easy solution, it will never be the first solution that's used. I mean, he says in Hallmall, I know a spell will make any woman sleep with me. But he spends seven or eight stanzas talking about, I can't get this woman to sleep with me. Right? So, I mean, like, it, it's very much, I, 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 I feel like if you've ever heard me talk about this sort of thing before, you're tired of this example, but it's very much like dreams, right? So I have a dream where I'm on campus, I'm running from a monster, it was the face of a particular person, and I'm trying to get to my truck. But as I run toward my truck, I pass all these other places that I could go, right? I could go in this building or that building. Why do I have to get to my truck in particular? Right? Why can't I stand and fight it? Right? Why do I have to get to my truck? But it's like I'm being railroaded toward the solution. I think that myths have a logic that's very much like dreams like that. And that's part of what makes them so distinct from modern attempts to write something like this. You can tell the difference instantly between a writer who knows what he's doing with making something actually seem mythy. J.R.R. Tolkien, I think, is a great example. And somebody who's trying to write a straightforward story that has answers for everything, right? Those fantasy novels aren't necessarily as, as memorable as the ones. Just like, why did they? Do, why did the hobbits just fly and not get? Right? I mean, they had the eagles, right? But that's but that feels very mythy, like this obvious solution that nobody uses. I think I think that's just very much that dream logic that you've got going on there. Right? I have lots of favorite examples. Of this. I'm like, hope to labor this. Uh, what does Thor ask all wise that tricks all wise? Because I oh, he doesn't wanted... trick him. I could have sworn it was the, the uh, what is open was for the ball there. No, he doesn't trick him exactly. When Thor, so yeah, there's the poem All of these Small, Words of All Wise, and the Politica, where this dwarf named All Wise, All of these, shows up at Thor's house and says, uh, he doesn't he doesn't recognize Thor. Thor says, What are you doing here? And he says, I'm here to marry Thor's daughter. Thor says, uh, well, you know. Hell, you are. So, like, who are you to tell me that I can't marry Thor's daughter? He's like, Thor. He says, Oh, well, I'd like to have your good opinion. 
And he says, well, you'll have my good opinion if you can answer these questions. And that's when he starts asking him, you know, like, what do they call the earth in the different realms? What do they call the seas? Like, he doesn't ask him a specific question that tricks him. He keeps him talking for so long that the sun comes up and turns into stone. <laughs> by the way, speaking of myth logic, that's the only story where dwarves are turned to stone by sunlight. And lots of stories that are out in the sun. Yeah. So, which is also what Gandalf does in the Hobbit to the trolls. To the trolls, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Gorgeous. That sounds weird. And a and a deeper cut from the poetic era in the poem Helgafi the Hjorvar Soma from the, the hero half of the poetic era. Um, one of Helgi's companions keeps a Jotun woman talking till the sun comes up and turns her to stone. But it seems like it's plot convenience playhouse, right? It's like they're vulnerable to sunlight. We need them to be vulnerable to sunlight. <laughs> so, or maybe that's the difference between dark elves and light elves. Uh, it's, there's, there's, you know, these things are laid out in story form, and there's no Wikipedia about the stuff that survives from back then. I should write one. This somebody say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, could I pass it off as a real manuscript? I don't know. Could that be my Breaking Bad? <laughs> like, I was talking to Henrik Wilhelms, who's one of the world's great renologists um, at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, and I said, you know, I, because he's constantly dealing with fake runestones, this is a growth industry for some reason. Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thankfully I'm not in Minnesota. Uh, it's not a place you want to talk about that, believe me. Uh, been there. Um, but I said, Eric, I think I'm the one person, maybe, maybe, one of like 10 people who could make one that would fool you. He's like, no, you can fool me. I don't know. Maybe I'll try something. But, um, uh, you know, I make April Fool's videos on my channel every year, and my very favorite so far is still 2021, where um, uh, my buddy who runs the Morrison Natural History Museum, we uh, discovered the uh, Kittredge Rinstone. <laughs> Which was embedded in the rib cage of a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Proving Vikings were not only here hundreds of years before the Spanish, they were here millions of years before the Spanish. <laughs> and you know what? People took it seriously. I knew that one coming here. I had someone tell me oh, yeah. I was lying to him about my 2023 April Fool's video about the Vikings discovering gunpowder, he said, I was lying about it being a lie. <laughs> I said, buddy, my entire sense of humor is lying to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, uh, he still thinks that I was telling him. I'm probably going too long here. When you are on YouTube talking about stuff that has any sort of mystical or religious connection, you are going to meet the world's most interesting people. <laughs> and I have encountered beliefs that fascinate me. Um, and I mean like beliefs about me that fascinate me. It's like, wow, okay, I did not realize that all of my videos contained coded messages. <laughs> or that I'm 11,000 years old. Or that the ghost of my grandfather said you needed his naked photos and that you could get them if you flew from Sydney, Australia. <laughs> to come to my office to demand them from me. Yeah. I apologize for this. Yeah. Some <laughs> fascinating stuff. Oh, yeah, you apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen her again. She did try to track down my room. Anyway, I've probably gone on too long. Try the cherry cluster. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that a famous uh, DC radio guy who was like hired to do Arby's? Uh, placement things. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I think this is one kind of story. It's like, it's like, I don't eat curly fries, but I'm told they're very good. <laughs> so, that's kind of my attitude. I don't train. So. All right. Well, thank you, folks. And um, well, from beautiful color, we all are. All best to you. Sequel, if you were here in January, I got this fixed. Hey. Roger Shearer here for Collins. 45 bucks to fix this fix. <laughs>